Hello friends, welcome to Houseplant Tips and Tricks. My name is Nick and today I'm going to give you some tips on caring for philodendrons. This series is sponsored by repotme.com. Get all of your indoor gardening supplies delivered to your door from one place. Repotme.com has practically anything you need for your orchids, succulents, and houseplants, including handmade potting mixes, planters, fertilizers, and much more. I of course think all plants are created equal, but I, early in my indoor gardening career, definitely grew a soft spot for philodendron plants and all aeroids, aeroid referring to any plant that falls into the Eraceae family, like pothos, syndapsis, syngonium, monsteras, but philodendrons are arguably the most popular one to collect. And in comparison to the other genera of aeroids, these ones just always seem to have new varieties popping up on the market literally every week, it feels like at this point. And while I wish I only had nice things to say about these plants because their leaves are beautiful and they will make such an impact on your home aesthetic with all their different types of foliage, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, unfortunately. So today I'm here to share some tips that I have to hopefully make caring for these sometimes finicky plants a lot easier. I have been growing philodendrons in my home for six or seven years now, starting off with the easier, more common varieties like the philodendron micans, the Hartley philodendron, philodendron imperial red, and then dipping my toes into the waters of the more collector varieties like the philodendron tortum or the philodendron gloriosum. So I do have intermediate experience with these plants, let's say, but that doesn't mean I've always had success with them and I'm constantly learning from my mistakes. So that's like what I wanna share with you most today. I think my biggest mistake that I made with philodendrons at first is not understanding their growth patterns. There are a good handful of different growth patterns that different philodendrons follow. The growth pattern we are likely most familiar with is climbing or trailing philodendrons, and those go hand in hand. So the trailing philodendron that's probably coming to mind most often is the philodendron micans or Hartley philodendron. There's plenty of different varieties of that specific philodendron, but that one is often sold in hanging baskets and will have probably like two feet of foliage already on it. You can hang it up, it'll grow down to the floor, producing foliage all the way down, and that plant is perfectly fine to grow as a trailing plant. That's why it's such a common philodendron because it's so easy to grow in that beautiful manner. But there are a lot of climbing philodendrons that might be sold in a hanging basket that might not appreciate that sort of setting. After they grow to be like a foot long or two feet long, they might start to put off foliage less often, skipping nodes here and there and having some sparse vines. The leaves might grow smaller and smaller and therefore the leaf shape can change. So a lot of these climbing philodendrons are often sold in a manner as trailing and it's not really a sustainable way to maintain the plant. They want to climb. You want to give these climbing house plants, a moss pole, a trellis, even just hold them up with a bamboo stake and that's going to make them feel like they're growing up a tree somewhat. But giving them like a moss pole or a wood trellis and really attaching them and allowing their roots to attach that surface is really where those specific plants are going to experience a major change in the way that they look. These climbing philodendrons in nature are going to creep along the ground until they find a host plant, usually a tree with a good amount of a trunk and good bark to grab onto and hold into place, little nooks and crannies for those roots to slip into. And as these plants start to grow up those trees, that's when their leaves are going to grow larger, the colors become more pronounced in many cases. Sometimes they'll lose their color, it all depends but it's just the wonderful way that trailing house plants grow and that many people as new indoor gardeners kind of miss. They'll buy a large hanging basket of like a silver sword philodendron and then try to just let it grow but then it's just a bunch of bluish little sticks just sticking out everywhere because it's not growing the way it wants. That philodendron wants to climb up a trellis or a moss pole and that's when it's going to start producing more leaves. So if you are growing a philodendron and you are experiencing exactly that, I might have just solved your problem. But there are, of course, more growth patterns that your philodendron could be following. There are self-heading philodendrons, so the philodendron Rojo Congo and philodendron Imperial Red, philodendron Birkin. These are some types of self-heading philodendrons that don't necessarily form a vine or a stem. They kind of stay really tight, kind of like the way an aloe plant grows or like a bird's nest fern or snake plant. They kind of circle their way around with their new leaves. Is there technically a stem that they're growing from? Yes, but those leaves are growing so tightly together that it's just not really apparent. It's not as easy to chop these plants to propagate them because they are so tightly grown together, although it is completely possible. And as these certain plants grow, 
micro, they're going to form more of a bush shape. It is such a wonderful type of philodendron to grow, but it's not a climbing philodendron. So you don't really need to do anything, which is fantastic because it's probably really the only type of philodendron that really takes care of itself. Actually, that's not necessarily true because there is another type of philodendron called tree philodendrons. And these philodendrons are technically not philodendrons anymore. These have been reclassified to the genus Thematophyllum. So if you've heard that or seen that long gibberish looking word and you thought, hey, I thought that was a philodendron, you are absolutely not wrong. And this plant right here is an example of a Thematophyllum. So this is now known as Thematophyllum sprucianum, but formerly was known as Philodendron goldii. You're probably going to see these plants listed as philodendrons for a long time, and that's perfectly fine. You can refer to it as a Philodendron Thematophyllum, whatever floats your boat. The tree Philodendron that is probably the most common, maybe you're familiar with it, is the Philodendron Hope now referred to as the Thematophyllum biponatophytum, but Philodendron Hope just rolls off the tongue a lot easier. <laughs> and these type of Philodendrons do form an actual woody trunk. So every time a leaf falls off the plant, similar to a Dracaena and the way that every time a leaf falls off the trunk forms a little bit more, the same thing happens here. You can kind of see in the base of mine, mine does have that small little woody trunk starting to form, but you're probably going to see this more apparent once you've had your plant for a couple of years. And of course, there is another growth pattern. There's also the cream Reaping philodendron, so philodendron gloriosum, philodendron may may, those are some of the more uh, relevant creeping philodendrons, and these do not climb, they do not form a trunk, they do not form a bush, they creep along the soil, they're not looking to climb up a tree, they just want to keep creeping along that soil, or rooting into the ground, and as they continue their way along the soil, rooting their way into the ground, that's how these particular plants are going to be encouraged to grow larger, more mature foliage. So how do you figure out which growth pattern your plant is growing? Well, to be honest, the easiest way is to just Google the name of your plant and figure out what type of philodendron it is. Now, climbing and creeping philodendrons are going to look very similar, while at the same time, self-heading and tree philodendrons are also going to look very similar. The main difference between the climbing and the creeping philodendrons is that the climbers like to work their way out of the planter while the creepers are going to try their best to stay inside the planter where the soil is. And the tree philodendrons and the self-heading philodendrons that the self-heading philodendrons are not going to form that woody trunk over time that those tree philodendrons are, of course, going to very prominently form. The reason it's so important to understand your plant's growth pattern is that if you want your plant's leaves to look as pristine and perfect as possible, you need to ensure that your plant is following the correct growth pattern and that you understand it. Tree philodendrons and self-heading philodendrons, as well as the few philodendrons that will happily trail for days, practically take care of themselves. They'll just need a little pruning here and there when it comes to removing those older leaves, but the creeping field engine and the climbing field engines, those are the ones you're gonna have to keep up with. Climbing, you're gonna have to, of course, keep continuously allowing them to climb or pruning them back if they're getting too tall. And the creeping field engines you're going to have to allow to stay along the soil, maybe increasing the pot size or using like a rectangular planter to really give them some space to continue to trail. If they don't have that soil, that's when those leaves are going to become smaller and weaker looking. So with that out of the way, we also need to discuss the soil that you are using for your philodendron. So that is probably next to understanding their growth pattern, I would say it's just as important. I was gonna say that's more important, but the soil is very important because if you don't have your plants in good soil, they're gonna die. I would not recommend planting a philodendron unless it's just like a standard Hartley for Mikan's philodendron, easy as pie, in regular potting mix right from the bag. Even if it's the best houseplant mix on planet Earth, just as I believe Rapotme's houseplant and tropical mixes, you're gonna have to amend it with some things that these roots want. Philodendron roots are thick and robust and they are looking for things to grab onto and they are not going to appreciate sitting in a soil that's going to stay a little too moist. They want air and space to breathe and all of that good stuff. So so what you are going to want to do is to amend your soil mixtures. The three things I would recommend keeping on hand as well as your regular soil mixture is perlite, charcoal, and orchid bark. I much prefer using a fine orchid bark in comparison to a chunkier, larger bark. I swear by the extra small Monterey pine bark from Rapotme.com. I will leave that link to my description below. And if you click through any of the links in the description to Rapotme's website and make any purchases to that link, I will earn a commission. So thank you very much in advance. If you do make any purchases, highly recommend the bark if you are an aeroid lover, that is for certain. The ratio of all of these things that I love to follow when I am making my philodendron mix is two parts of my standard houseplant soil mix, one part perlite, 
one part orchid bark, and a good handful of charcoal, up to one part is perfectly fine, but I usually go a little bit lighter on the charcoal. That perlite and orchid bark is really going to add some good aeration into your soil, really giving those roots something to grab onto while also allowing them to breathe and really work their way through the cracks and crevices inside their planters. The charcoal helps keep the soil light and airy as well, but also keeps the soil clean. If I am working with a philodendron that likes a little extra moisture in the soil, or if I'm working with a planter that dries out extremely fast, like this planter right here that's made of this unglazed, not quite terracotta, but something unglazed that just sucks the moisture out of the planter, I will throw a nice handful of sphagnum moss into the mixture, and I just find that helps keep the moisture up, but it's not going to keep the soil wet itself. That sphagnum moss is just going to hold onto a little extra moisture itself, and the roots love that sphagnum moss. They love grabbing onto it, so I find that really helps. So a little tip from me to you. My biggest complaint with growing philodendrons is that they are pest magnets. I think the root of the pest problems that I experience in my home come from my philodendron plants, particularly on the new leaves. This is something I experience every spring and summertime when my philodendrons start spitting out new leaves. I'm constantly checking those new leaves for thrips in particular, but spider mites and mealybug as well. They've also been culprits on my new leaves. My assumption is that many philodendrons have complex leaf shapes and also many of their leaves are on the thinner side. And while they are emerging as new leaves, they're very tightly rolled up and that is a perfect space for those nasty pests to hide. So I'm always keeping a very close eye on the new leaves on my plants. This is the newest leaf on my philodendron goldie eye right here. And of course I have found some pests on it. And I try everything. I use systemics in the soil. I use houseplant sprays, insecticidal soaps, finicid sprays. I will wipe down the leaves with rubbing alcohol. They never go away. I use beneficial insects in my home. They never go away. So philodendrons are a pest magnet, <laughs> at least in my experience. So please just beware. I hope that you go unaware of these pests for as long as possible, hopefully because they are not there and not because you are not noticing them, but in my experience, it is just inevitable. So take as many preventative measures as you possibly can and always go the extra mile to make sure that your philodendrons are as clean as possible. My last tip for today is probably the hottest take, but it is 1000% something I've learned from experience. And if I could go back in time, I would tell myself. I would really recommend sticking with the tried and true, more common philodendrons. I know we all get plant fever, especially when you start tipping your toes in philodendrons. There are so many varieties out there. Once you see like aeroid addicts and aeroid collectors on Instagram, you're gonna start seeing so many like wacky and fun leaf shaped varieties and it's so tempting to try them out. Some of them cost a lot of money. And as I was just talking about, many of them are pest magnets. I'd say the harder to find varieties in particular are pest magnets. And that's because these plants, I mean, no plants are meant to be grown inside. All plants, no matter if it's a house plant or not, even if it's been cultivated as a house plant for so many years, plants are meant to grow outside. So when we grow plants inside, they are stressed out. So if you live in Florida and you have space in your backyard, by all means, go all out, get all these fun philodendrons because they're going to grow so well for you. They're not gonna grow as well for me in my apartment here in Philadelphia. And I've learned the hard way. And many of these plants also have like attributes about them beyond just being pest magnets and getting stressed all the time that I don't like that stress me out. Like a lot of these hard to find philodendrons, they produce a lot of sugar sap and they get really sticky and the whole undersides of the leaves are just coated in this stickiness and it doesn't matter if you use rubbing alcohol and wipe it away, it's just gonna come back and it's gonna get all over you all the time. And it's not fun. <laughs> I still love these plants. I just don't love many of their attributes and I kind of wish that I never brought some of these filled engines into my home because now I just have to deal with sticky messes all the time and I paid money for these and I'm not willing to get rid of them because they've grown so well for me and they have a place in my heart, but I wish they didn't. <laughs> Sounds so terrible to say, but I really wish they didn't because the longer that I have been doing indoor gardening, I'm realizing that I plan on living a long life. It's kind of my goal. And these plants kind of also have that same goal and I'm stuck with them unless I give them up, which like I said, they have a place in my heart. So I'm like less likely to give them up the longer I have them. 
And I don't wanna be stuck with a bunch of gross, slimy, sticky, pest-ridden houseplants. I wanna focus on more growing the plants that are going to make my home look as good as possible and look their best over time and look 10 years down the line like something that no one else has in their home and looks just like just so one of a kind. I'm not going to experience that with philodendrons and I'm constantly cutting back to the base because they're growing too big and the inner nodes are getting too long and it's not producing leaves because it's outgrown the moss pole, whatnot. So many reasons to stick with the tried and true varieties that have been grown in the home for years and not like a matter of months. And by all means, learn this for yourself. We all have to make our own mistakes and have our own experiences. And we see the philodendrons that catch our eye and we're like, I have to have it. Just as we do with all plants, I just know that philodendrons are particularly addicting. I just don't want you to waste hundreds or thousands of dollars on plants that you're going to find out down the line are not really that maintainable in the home. I would much rather you spend like $200 on a huge, large, established philodendron Rojo Congo or Monstera Deliciosa, some philodendron or aeroid that's going to look gorgeous and be very maintainable and sustainable in your home, instead of spending that $200 on a very small little four inch pot of a variegated hoozy what's it. But that's going to do it for today's video. My care tips for philodendrons. Thank you to repotme.com for sponsoring this series as always. As I mentioned, I will leave anything I talked about in the description below and if you click through those links to repotme.com's website and make any purchases I will earn a commission so thank you very much in advance and you can use code Nick to save 10% on any potting mix from repotme.com so thank you so much for joining me if you don't already you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Philly Foliage subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and I will see you guys in my next video have a great day